Hey everyone, so in today's video what I wanted to do was just go over the decision making behind why I actually chose the LG C9 OLED over the Samsung Q90R. These were the two TVs I was looking at when I actually uh, decided to make the new TV purchase and I've come up with a list of different things that actually helped sway um, the decision. So what I'll do is start on the Samsung side and just point out everything that was attracting me to the Q90R initially. So first and foremost was the One Connect box. Obviously for the install and the fact that I've got the media console, this would have made it a lot easier for cable management. Um, just being able to tuck the box away. It would have also helped with the soundbars wiring as well if I could actually hide everything out of the way. The next thing on the list was the lack of burning risk. So obviously uh, with OLEDs, um, you've got the, the risk of burning. Um, with this, with my particular usage, there was always that, that worry in the back of my mind before I'd looked into both technologies. Um, and initially, obviously this was one of the things that was pointing me towards the Samsung. The next one on the list is quite ironic really. Um, with the stand installed, the Samsung Q90R actually has around 90 millimeter clearance, um, which is actually more than enough for the LG soundbar. Ironically, the LG TV, when the stand is installed, you only get around 30 millimeters clearance, which isn't actually enough for its own soundbar. Um, and you end up with the situation where you have to choose whether to raise the TV, to have the soundbar obstruct the bottom edge of the TV or to obviously wall mount and the wall mount option was the one that I obviously went, went with. The next thing on the list is HDR10+. Plus. Now there's very few TVs out there um, that I was looking at in terms of this sort of category of, of uh, TV that has HDR10 plus support. However, on the flip side, there's also very little content out there um, that I personally consume. However, obviously HDR10 Plus is a standard that um, requires more from the manufacturer. So it, um, I believe it requires a minimum of like a thousand nits brightness. Um, and then it obviously stretches all the way up to 10,000 nits. Um, this is something that obviously very few TVs are gonna actually have HDR10 Plus uh, certification. So this is one of the things that was pointing me towards the Samsung and was working it in its favor. And the final one on the list is the peak brightness. The reason for this is because of how much um, people will actually use this to um, knock the OLEDs down. So obviously with the OLEDs having a peak brightness of around 700 nits, seven to 800 nits, and with uh, the Samsung QLED having it, I believe it's around 2000, I'm not sure on the exact number, but obviously it's, it's quite a bit brighter. Um, the reason I haven't listed the QLED um, connotation down is because that's just kind of a given and it's also something that probably doesn't actually um, favor itself to, to my uh, viewing habits. I don't personally like um, the overly saturated and overly vivid colors that Samsung normally go with on their TVs and uh, phone screens. So that's something that even though it's, it's kind of obvious, I've not actually listed it down um, because it doesn't actually relate to this kind of versus um, QLED versus OLED um, fight off if you like. Right, so coming on to the LG side of things, the obvious one is the perfect blacks and I've listed obviously no blooming. Uh, that It's not just the fact that you get the perfect blacks, it's, it's more so the fact that you there is no blooming around text or small um, bright objects. One of the reasons I actually upgraded uh, the TV initially was because of, primarily because I upgraded the, the soundbar as well and it, it just upped the, the whole experience and then I just needed a TV to match the, the sound that it was actually producing. But one of the other reasons uh, I wanted it was whilst watching movies I noticed because I now went from watching it with some sort of ambient lighting to almost a pure black room. Um, I found that all of these kind of um, spotted backlights that you get from LED TVs um, that don't have local dimming, um, it's, it was just really off-putting. 
one of the things that obviously the, the Samsung does have is local dimming. However, the fact that it, the way in which it works is it'll either give you pure blacks in the background, but it'll, the local dimming will be very aggressive. So in order to do that, um, and you, there's examples other YouTubers have put up where they'll show a Starfield uh, scene, for example, and what it'll do is uh, the local dimming will be so aggressive that it'll almost dim out and you'll, you'll end up missing stars and other details in the, in the, the video. Um, I believe it was Gravity, the movie. Um, there was a scene in that that a lot of you, um, YouTubers actually posted when they did their OLED versus QLED comparisons. And in that particular scene, um, half, half the, the stars in that particular scene almost disappear because the, the local dimming algorithms want to be so aggressive in terms of getting rid of any noise and any blooming that you end up missing most of the picture. And for somebody whose primary use for this TV was going to be movies and TV shows, that was a, quite a major thing when I actually saw that um, and saw them side by side. Right, so the next one on the list is HDMI 2.1. Now, this isn't something necessarily that I need. Um, this is more so me just trying to future-proof the TV as much as possible. When I was looking at all the various brands and eventually narrowed it down to these two, um, the one common theme between most of them was very few 2019 TVs actually came fully equipped with HDMI 2.1. They may have had some of the features as the Samsung does of ALLM or VRR and they'll have certain features but they won't actually be fully HDMI 2.1 certified so there'll still be some features in there maybe bandwidth uh, maybe something else that they've not fully signed up for and they've not fully um, been accredited or certified for so because of that obviously this purchase um, I don't tend to buy TVs every day um, my previous two TVs I've actually had um, for over 10 years uh, two LG plasma TVs um, and the reason I've kept them for so long is because firstly they just didn't die and secondly the picture quality was brilliant on them um, I may do a future video on them um, as, as a side note but obviously when I'm looking at it I, I'm not expecting this maybe to last another 10 years but even if it lasts another five years I don't want to have have to be upgrading the TV again in that period because of a lack of features if I upgrade because I find something that I like and I just want to treat myself, that's different. However, if I was to come across a scenario where, for example, either a games console or some sort of future technology with regards to Blu-rays comes out and it requires two point, uh, HDMI 2.1 and I, I don't have it, then at that point that would be something that I'd look back on and think I made a mistake there. So for that reason, HDMI 2.1 is just a peace of mind in terms of future proofing it for me. Right, so the next one on the list is Dolby Vision. And this is actually one of the key um, points that I actually use to make my decision. Uh, Dolby Vision in, is involved in almost all of the content uh, that I actually consume. Most of the TV shows and movies that I'll, I'll watch either via streaming services or anything that I've got. Um, downloaded will usually be in Dolby Vision uh, format for the most part and because of that obviously this is where it comes back to the HDR10 Plus uh, and Dolby Vision kind of uh, fight off that that both of these manufacturers are, are going down so Samsung obviously doesn't want to go down the Dolby Vision route because they don't believe in paying for the accreditation for Dolby Vision they believe HDR10 Plus which is um, I believe it's a free uh, accreditation so you don't, there's no uh, royalties or anything that you have to pay for it um, but they want to go down that route and that's the reason they don't actually have any of their hardware uh, Dolby Vision certified so you won't find any at, the, at this point as far as I'm aware anyway um, and especially at that point they, they didn't have any TVs that support Dolby Vision LG on the other hand, because obviously they're using um, OLED technology, um, whilst you can use dynamic tone mapping to give the effect of um, a higher peak brightness, um, which 
in in effect they're, they're doing with Dolby Vision anyway because I'm not sure 100% but I, I'm sure I read somewhere that even for Dolby Vision you're supposed to have a minimum of 1000 nits brightness um, obviously the OLED isn't going to hit that but it's it's proper Dolby Vision it is uh, fully certified and accredited and for that reason it's obviously a big factor in pulling me towards the LG right so the next one on the list is HomeKit Apple HomeKit now at the time when I was actually looking into both of these TVs um, something may have changed in the in the meantime because I know um, App AirPlay 2 has been pushed out as well as the Apple Plus um, streaming service app has been pushed out to Samsung TVs as well in the meantime however Apple HomeKit support at the time when I was actually looking at these wasn't actually um, supported on the Q90R and that's something that was quite big in terms of my lifestyle in how I actually use the TV. Um, I had a little hack set up on my previous setup where I had a smart plug and I would um, control that using Siri shortcuts so whenever I wanted to watch football for example I just push one button on the shortcut and it basically load everything up for me and then when I was going out I'd hit another button and it'd switch everything off now that wasn't doing it correctly because um, essentially what it was doing was cutting the power to the TV which on that particular TV didn't matter too much because um, it was a TCL TV it's technically a smart TV but um, the actual interface and everything was so slow that I never actually used it I would only actually use it through the Apple TV um, so for that reason I wanted something that I didn't need to do that workaround for I wanted something that actually worked on its own and it had uh, actual um, HomeKit support right so the next one on the list is EARC um, this similarly again is just future proofing uh, the actual system obviously I've already got the LG S uh, SL10 YG soundbar. The soundbar itself, for some strange reason, it, despite it being um, the 2019 model and the TV being a 2019 model, doesn't actually support um, eARC. However, the, the TV does. Um, if at some point further down the line I do um, upgrade the sound system, which I would consider depending on the price, um, going to the, the SN11. Um, for the 2020 model for the, the soundbar but for that obviously I just wanted something that definitely had all the features and as far as the LG C9 OLED is concerned um, most of the things that I wanted um, on the list were ticked so eARC was definitely one of those right so the next one on the list may not make sense to most people but for me it personally does so i've put down that the, the lg c9 has a glossy finish rather than a diffused finish as you get on the um, samsung q90r the reason i prefer the glossy one is if you ever look at side by side comparisons what you'll notice is with anything that has a diffused kind of um, finish on, on on the glass what tends to happen is in a bright room it'll obviously perform better than the glossy um, reflective uh, screen with any directly direct light or for example a reflection of a window however what happens is as soon as you make that into a dark room you know that that coating no longer matters because you're not getting that reflection however where it does cause a problem for me personally and I've found this down the years of using these kind of screens is if you shine a light in it because it's diffusing that the uh, the sharpness of the light so rather than it be just being a pinpoint light it's basically diffused out and it scatters out and what tends to happen is um, with my room setup because I've got the windows on one side and the TVs up against the wall for most places I would sit in that room you would not get any reflection from the window there's one side of the room where you would get reflection, but whenever we're watching anything, we'll have the curtains drawn, so basically the room's blacked out. Now, where this would cause a problem was would be as soon as you switch the light on and you've got a light coming from on top or anywhere else, what happens is the light scatters off that type of panel and for certain people it actually causes eye strain and for me personally I always find that it causes eye strain for me so for example if I'm using a laptop screen or if I'm using most 
uh, PC desktop monitors, I find that the actual um, diffusing of the light actually causes quite a lot of eye strain for me. Whereas glossy, um, glossy glass screens, I never have any problems with, even if they've got more of a reflection on them. So I, I actually prefer to have to deal with um, just basically diffusing out the light in terms of uh, closing the curtains rather than having that type of a finish on the panel. The other point is obviously the sharpness that you get from um, a screen that is glossy will always be, be higher than uh, one that you basically has that kind of diffused uh, layer on top. The reason I know this is because the plasma screens that I actually had prior to these, um, the two LG TVs I mentioned earlier, um, because of where I had them, I had to actually order a diffused kind of um, film that I, I put over the top of these TVs um, just to basically uh, uh, kill off all the light that was actually reflecting off them. As soon as I fitted that film, I noticed straight away that um, the sharpness had basically gone down and I actually had to crank up the sharpness. Now, um, obviously with Samsung producing the TVs, they would have already factored this in and they've probably already cranked up the, the sharpness of it. But the clarity and everything that you get from a pure glass, um, almost like a see-through glass screen, there, there will be a little bit of um, light rejection film built into the, the C9 as well but the, the actual top layer is a lot more glossy compared to the almost matte type finish that you get on the Q90R. And as I say, this is purely subjective. This is just something that I personally prefer. And um, that was one of the things I was actually working in the LG's uh, favor for me. Right, and the final one on the list is basically comes down to power consumption. So because of how much I will be using these TVs um, and because this is a second TV so we have a, uh, a primary one in the living room that the kids uh, mainly use and I also use whenever we're, we're just watching something that we're not really too concerned about something that we're just sitting down quickly to watch um, and basically the, the living room is a bit more cozier so basically we can just sit down and watch something casually there but anytime I'm, I'm personally watching anything either movies um, any of the TV shows that I'm into, any of my sports, anything like that. Most of that time, both TVs will probably be uh, be on at the same time. And because of that, I am quite conscious of um, the actual power consumption, both in terms of money that it's costing, as well as obviously the environment as well. Now, when you actually look at the figures and you compare them, um, it's quite a big difference in terms of, this is obviously just an a average um, that most people would have in Europe. And if you're looking at 190 kilowatt hours per annum compared to 290 kilowatt hours per annum, um, you're talking um, roughly, I think 190 kilowatt hours is something like about 80, 80 pounds in the UK and 290 would probably come to, I'd say over, over 160, 170-ish, depending on hours of use and obviously various factors in terms of the um, electric uh, electric pricing and the rates and everything. But obviously the, the fact that this was a lot more economical in terms of um, power consumption, with the amount of use that I'm gonna be getting out of it, and even right now, whilst I'm not really watching anything, um, even though everybody else is on lockdown, I've still had to carry on working um, almost the whole time. Um, I think I had about a week off. But even right now, my son still uses it quite a lot for gaming. Sometimes he'll be gaming for six to eight hours a day, not all in one go obviously, but um, collectively, if you, if you total it all up, um, it'll, it'll basically come to between six and eight hours a day minimum. So even right now, whilst I'm not personally using it, it's still getting quite a lot of usage out of it. And for most of that time, the living room TV will also be on. So the fact that the living room TV, I don't believe is very economical. Um, I'll pull up some um, figures and stuff for that somewhere down the line, maybe uh, once I actually do a video on that particular TV. 
um, but with this one obviously the fact that this is so much more economical than the, the Samsung and obviously in the long run this is just going to save you more and more money so that was something that works in its favor it's not necessarily as with most of these things it was is mainly subjective and things that were tipping the scales for me so these are the kind of things obviously I looked into all the other things as well so how the picture processing is um, how the the colors reproduction all of these kind of things but the, the primary ones for me really w were the the Dolby Vision HDMI 2.1 um, eARC and also the home kit um, uh, compatibility they were the main things that actually pushed me towards the the OLED now having said all of that the first time I actually got the TV set up um, the, the the test that I actually used used it for was to play um, Avengers uh, I believe it was Avengers Endgame and the reason I played this was anybody who's seen the Avengers movies from I think it was from after the the first Avengers movie um, the opening sequence changed to where um, it would show the characters and it'd have this um, black background with the Marvel logo and I'd never seen that particular scene excuse the pun um, where the background was so black it was just pure black I'd never actually seen it in that way and the red of the Marvel logo just popped so much and this was this was still when I had it on uh, the normal Dolby Vision um, cinema home kind of setting this before I even changed it to uh, warm white compared to warm two so it would have had a little warmer kind of hue to it uh, which is the um, calibrated settings but even even with those settings the the, the way that the picture popped um, instantly like the first literally the first time I even watched anything on the TV I was just blown away so obviously I was vind the the decision uh, that I made was vindicated instantly and obviously the more I used it the more the more I I found things that I absolutely loved with it um, the first time my son used this compared to the previous LED TV that he was using um, instantly he said to me it's so fast and basically everything is just so responsive so overall obviously there's there's more factors to it than just this simple list that i've made but these are some of the kind of um tipping points between the two and these uh, these are things that i've only just um kind of rethought of recently because i wanted to make this video when i was actually making the decision um i uh, before i make any purchase I'd, i do a lot of research in terms of checking the differences between various technologies um, what would suit me and ultimately this is as I said this is purely subjective because it suits my needs for most people and I, I, I do have a lot of people asking me what they should go for which TV they should go for which soundbar whether it's worth getting a soundbar all these kind of things and what I'll always ask them is what their setup is what their usage is and what they're expecting from it obviously the price price comes into it as well but really you need to find out all of those other things before you even factor price in um, for most people out there um, I would probably recommend the QLED just because of the fact that most people will use it in a bright room for me personally because of my usage and because of how I've used uh, my previous TVs and I knew what I was going to be using it for how I was going to be using it I knew that bright room dark room wasn't an issue and if anything I prefer dark room viewing anyway um, and I've, I've really gone off the ambient kind of uh, backlighting um, the Philips Hue kind of look obviously you've seen in my videos I've got the the backlighting in the, uh, the videos but it isn't something that I ever have on during um, either gaming or whilst I'm watching movies or sports or anything um, I will kill all the light completely dead because it looks good in the build up like just before you, you're about to play a movie or anything like that but whilst you're watching a movie you don't want that distraction and especially once you've seen an OLED screen like this you realize that all that other light it's just distracting from the fact that um, basically all other TVs can't really reproduce that pure black that's why they need that tiny bit of ambient lighting whereas with this um, because of the fact that you can get pure black so you can just kill all the lights and enjoy the content as as probably you've never seen it before so yeah that that was the list um, of basically my uh, my thoughts 
as always if you like this video please hit the thumbs up button um, if you could subscribe and share as well it really would help the channel out i am trying to grow this channel as much as i can and the sooner i can get to a thousand sub subscribers which is my primary target um, the the better it will be and the, the faster i can actually churn out more videos and actually get more content as well if i can get somewhere down the line where i've got enough viewers then um, i'm hoping to try and reach out to some retailers and maybe do some side by side comparisons of tv soundbars all that kind of stuff but in order to get there obviously you need uh, a much bigger subscriber base um, i think 90 percent of my views at the moment for my channel are coming from people that aren't subscribed to to my channel so obviously all those people that are clicking on the videos and whether you're, you're enjoying it if you're not enjoying it then obviously post it in the comments below because i need to know um, what it is that you don't enjoy maybe i can change something up or alternatively obviously if, if the channel isn't for you then that's that's fair enough but for anybody out there who's into any type of tech or um it's mainly tech that i'll be posting um but obviously it, it will be various types of videos that i'll be posting as well so there will be a lot of videos coming um i normally aim for trying to produce at least one video a day which is more than any other youtuber out there um, once i get to a certain level i want to try and just increase the quality um and the production uh values behind the the videos so that may reduce it and may drop it down to maybe two or three videos a week but at the moment whilst i'm just using my, my phone and being able to produce in this way um, i'm aiming for one video a day so then you've got loads of content and even if one of the videos doesn't uh pique your interest there'll be there'll definitely be something in there that will as always thanks for watching